Well, I'm Carolyn Swift, and I'm the director of the Capitola Museum. And today, I'm um, visiting with Tom King, who's lived, who's been in and around Capitola since the early 1925. 20, 1925. So, it, and actually, you know, I was thinking about um, the times that how I've come across you in history. I thought there was more than one Tom King, because I. I remember when you had the Courtyard Restaurant in uh, uh, Capitola mm -hmm. in the 60s. 68. Was it 68? And then, uh, and then you were at Cabrillo College, um, the Culinary Arts Program at Cabrillo in the 70s, is that right? Well, I taught it <clears throat> for Santa Cruz High School. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and that was, and then... Uh, and then I, I went back to Pennsylvania, but <clears throat> the... Uh, I didn't like the job because the job was in the morning, uh -huh. and I lived 50 miles away from school, and my next class was 6 o'clock at night, Oh, and I couldn't... No, that wasn't good. No, it was no good. So, so back to California. So you came back here. <clears throat> but I, and I knew those two were you, because I, I have pictures, but then I found some pictures that showed a New Brighton Beach, and there were some fishermen at New Brighton that turned out to be Tom Lindsay, and on the back Tom it Lindsay, said... Yeah. It said, photos from Tom King, and I didn't realize that was you. And then I came across the story about the Save Old Capitola Committee and how you, you know, were helping save buildings in Capitola also in the early 60s. So it seems, oh, and then I found the, um, uh, that magazine from San Francisco uh, that had a photograph that you'd taken. It said, Tom King photographer and it was taken when Capitola became a city. Right, yeah, and the, the magazine, the Bing Crosby. Owned. Fortnight magazine. Fortnight. Yes, it was owned by Bing Crosby. And, uh, and I didn't realize that was you also. So um, you have, you, 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 even though you haven't lived in Capitola all this time, you come back here and you've told, um, you've become a chapter in our history <laughs> on several occasions. So um, I thought maybe you could tell us about uh, the King family and how it came to Capitola, how your family got here and got the house on Stockton. And well, the <clears throat> family came from Hollister, and uh, the um, there was a Spanish <clears throat> land grant was divided up into land plots, uh -huh. and salesmen in the old days, way back, used to go into states like Iowa, Missouri and so forth, and sell people plots of land. And if you bought so many, so much acreage in the town site, <clears throat> they would name a street after you. And the family's name originally, on my mother's side, was Sally. Uh -huh. And so it's S-A-L-L-I-E. And when they were making the street signs in Hollister, the um, sign maker said, oh, that couldn't be right, S-A-L-L-I-E. Let's make it like the girl, Sally, S-A-L-L-Y. Oh, uh -huh. So Sally Street is still in Hollister. Oh, really? So that's your family? <clears throat> yeah, oh. and they, they got acreage in Hollister and then a couple of ranches that they had, but since they've sold year over the years. If you go into Hollister <clears throat> where the... Uh, Big shopping mall is uh -huh. on McCray Street. Uh -huh. That used to be an orchard. That was our orchard. What did you? What kind of apricots? Apricots. And when I was a kid, I hated it. I had to cut apricots. I bet. <laughs> so we used to come to Capitola in month of May, and then when apricots started, back to Hollister we went. Oh, okay. To, to, to take the care season. of the business of. Cutting apricots. So you were here right when Capitola opened every year? Every, every year. <clears throat> and uh, we lived on Stockton Street. And uh, So was it a large house? or? A little, it was, was a two-story house. Oh, okay. We had, there were bedrooms above and living quarters, dining room and living room and so forth, downstairs. Uh -huh. And then <clears throat> when the family did, did went different ways. They made the upstairs a living quarter and the downstairs a living quarter so we could be there at different times. Different times, I see. Yeah. 
So, so you have brothers and sisters, or no? Nope, I'm the only little brat. No. Ah, but you have cousins. I know. Oh yeah, cousins. lots of cousins. Uh, so, did they all come at the same time too? Was it just no? They didn't like Capitola. Oh, they didn't. No, they. Uh, I was the only one in the family that really liked coming to Capitola. My mother and I liked Capitola because it was cold, uh, cooler, foggy. No, it was just fun. Yeah, it was fun, and. Uh, I learned to swim here, oh. and I used to go up and down Soquel Creek on the old steamboat that they had. Oh yeah, and is that Andrew Bear? Andrew. I can't remember the name of it, but it was. He went up and down from the beach up the river and deck, and he used to have a megaphone, and he'd <clears throat> he'd holler up, up, up the river, blow his little whistle, and up he'd go. Oh and yes, back. He went almost to Soquel. Did he? Yeah. Went up to past Long's drugstore wow. on the creek and turn around. So did they dredge the creek? Do you do you know if they had? I don't know if they dredged it or not. They um, they always put a dam up, yeah. a big dam across. Oh. And they had a, <clears throat> a life tower, um, life saving tower there. Uh huh. And the lagoon. And. On right, right by the lagoon, so he could see out to the ocean. Uh -huh. I mean, the bay, uh -huh. and up the lagoon, and then uh, they had a raft out by a big rope all the way out to anchored out. People used to swim out to the raft and back. See, so what's your earliest memory of Capitola? Do you have a? <laughs> <laughs> you laugh. Taking a bath at the old hotel. Oh, that was it. So <laughs> the, here, this hotel. Yeah, the old hotel. <clears throat> and the, uh, they had, along the beach side, they had bathtubs for rent. Nobody in Capitola had a bathtub because they were only here for maybe a couple of weeks of summer or that. And so um, the hotel made a lot of money on the locals taking baths at the Oh, hotel. so they charged. They it charged. Wasn't... Oh, yeah. Because I, I thought that maybe it was a free No, thing. no, no. No, those people didn't. So local people had to pay. I, that yeah. makes more sense. That's more consistent with the Heen Company. Yeah, the, um, you you paid. And there pay. was there was a nice walkway down the side. It's kind of crumbled now, but it's a nice walkway where that little park is. Uh huh. And uh, the bathtubs overlooked the bay. You could watch the. Was it salt water or regular? Water? I think it was regular water. Uh -huh. And. Um, but uh, we went there uh, after a couple of days. Every couple of days, we'd go in there and get a good soaking. <laughs> yeah. It's so you'd play on the beach and then... Play on the beach and uh, and did a little fishing. And the Capitola Pier was quite different than it is today. I mean, it was... Longer? Shorter? Oh, they had davits where they brought up oh, the fishing the boats. they brought the boats up. And uh, they... Um, was the fishing community still there? The colony of fishermen? The, oh, yeah. The yeah, Canepas and the Brigantes? Right. And, the, and they had a little fish market where there's an ice cream parlor now. Yeah, and, that was the Canepas. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then it later became a little restaurant, which was a good restaurant. That was Casserola. You know the Casserola, yeah. Frank Casserola? Yeah, that was, uh, I forgot the name of it. but. Uh, and next door was friendly uh, Albert Nussbaum's. Red and white grocery store. Oh yes, which is not there anymore. So you remember the stores downtown pretty well. Oh you yeah, came every year. <clears throat> so did you? So you would have missed the year the hotel burned in twenty nine. You would. Well, it burned. It burned. Yeah, it burned twenty nine, twenty eight, twenty eight. Was it? Twenty eight. Twenty nine. Yeah. yeah. I was about ten years old, I think, and. Uh, and I remember we all piled into the old car and from Holliston and went over to see what was left of the hotel. What was left? Yeah, not much. <laughs> <laughs> they did a good job when they burned it down. They did. They did. So did they scrape it off into the bay, or do you know if they? I can't remember. I know they 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 cleaned it up, and uh, um, well, you did know you... how kids are at that time age. They don't pay attention to too much what the adults were saying That's about true. it. That's true. That's true.
Did they ever talk about it being a set fire or Well, arson? there were rumors. There were rumors. There were talk. There was talk about it. Yeah. But because uh, it very conveniently burned just before the depression. Yeah, just just before it was October. Right, yeah. No, it was right after. Yeah. It was right after. Yeah, yeah. two months later. Um, but, uh, and he was insured. He, he was. He did have insurance. Oh, he had insurance. Yeah. Well, I that part I did couldn't remember. Yeah, yeah. So did did you know Teddy Woodhouse? Did you ever see him? No, no. My great grandfather did. He he was he my great grandfather and Heen, uh -huh. the Redwood man was. They were in partners or something in, in selling lumber in the oh. Capitol area. And uh, at one time I had quite a collection of Wharf Road logging pictures because wow. they used to bring the logs up Wharf Road and out to the pier uh -huh. and load them on the ships. But uh, I don't know what happened to them over the years. He probably lent them to historians. So, some of you. <laughs> <laughs> So that's that's interesting because they they talk about Wharf Road being uh, what allowed the pier to be built and you know the yeah um, Wharf Road went from Soquel to Capitola and uh, where Shadowbrook is now was a uh, a big home and a, a woman lived there she had uh, three grandchildren we used to play there oh and. Uh, the cable car wasn't there. We had to walk up and down the stairs. So you went down to the actual house itself? Oh, now. yeah. We used to play there. We played there on the bank of Soquel Creek. And, we, cause it would, and then Soquel Creek at that time had a long boardwalk that ran all the way from the foot of the railroad trestle all uh -huh. the way up almost to Soquel. Wow. So you could just walk along? Yeah, it was a wooden plank. And the people used to go up in rowboats and... You would see people in their Sunday bests and their guys and that gals kind of rowing, rowing, yeah. rowing up the creek. Did they still have tents? In the, did they have camping tent ground? Camping? They had, there was, uh, where, near, right near your office here, there's a little, there's a, mot, I mean a motor home, I mean a trailer park. Yes. And there were a lot of people had transients in there, but I don't remember exactly how they lived. I know there were a few of them had trailers. Yeah, they, hobos, they, they call them. Well, hobos. they weren't, they were families sometimes. Ah, but so it was like, but it wasn't like a, a set up tent camp like Keen had. There must have, there, I think there was, but I can't, I can't, I know. You didn't come up this way much. No. If, yeah, because I think it was up here. Because when I was a little kid, Beach. 11 or 12, <laughs> I sold newspapers. Oh. And uh, Examiner, Chronicle, and Mercury Herald paper. <laughs> and uh, Hungry Baby Bites Off Mother's Arm uh -huh. headlines. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we used to sell papers to the uh, uh, California National Guard camp that was up here. The CCC camp? No, it was a National Guard where they had coast artillery. Okay, so Camp McQuaid. No, it was right up here where the grammar school is. Yeah, that's, uh, near that's Park Camp, Avenue. Camp McQuaid, yeah. Was that Camp yeah, McQuaid? Yeah, it was Camp McQuaid. I, I didn't even remember what they call it. And I do remember they used to, the old Capitola Airport. And uh, at first, they uh, didn't have enough money to make it a really good airport. So they used to build a big bomb fire down at one end of it. And that was their <gasps> smoke, their, their windsock. Oh winds, my gosh! Wind was and that's this how. Way. Oh, <laughs> so you now we have pictures. I have a picture of the airport. Uh, this is later. Um, and then I just was going to show you how it when they built the highway, which was 60 years ago. Yeah, they used to have the fire over on the on the corner here. Oh, okay. So let people know um, which way the wind was going. Which, yeah, which way the wind was going. Oh. Did they ever have any plane accidents that you remember? I don't. I was in the summertime. There were quite a few planes coming in, and uh, they but were, this is this is where the uh, encampment was. Up yeah, there. yeah, right there. Yeah. So you sold newspapers up there. Sold newspapers up there. So <clears throat> to make sure the two paper boys got there on time, the camp commandant used to send a car down to pick us up. 
went all the papers from Capitola, and then we lugged them up. That was really important to them. Then. Oh yeah, it was yeah. important to them because not many people had radios. Uh -huh. None of them had radios, in fact. So they were just waiting for the paper. Yeah, yeah. Well, we sold a lot of papers to all those. We got a lot of military buttons and swap for papers. Oh, I bet. <laughs> was it? Now I I read that there was the number of um, men that were stationed there, the camp there almost doubled the size of Capitola. Oh yeah, they were, they were swarms couple, of couple them. hundred. Yeah, yeah. and uh, they used to have the barge towed out in the bay. Yeah, and uh, they used to, coast artillery used to shoot shells at the t barge that they were. Towing. So you did you ever see that? Yeah, the, you did. Oh yeah. So you saw them shooting at the uh, yeah. over the ocean. Yeah. Which and direction did they shoot they at? They shot towards Monterey. So they over New Brighton, over, over New, New Brighton. Brighton. Yeah, right straight out over the over the uh, encampment towards Monterey. So you think there's a lot of shells down there? <laughs> oh, I'm sure there must be, and uh, lots of people used to go to the old concrete ship. Uh huh. Um, and and got there dancing. Watch, watch them. Oh, shoot. and watch them shoot. Yeah, watch oh, them. Those would be like free fireworks. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's I never thought of that, but yeah. that would have been. So that was sort of a form of entertainment during the Depression, was you'd watch them shoot off the, uh, the guns? Well, I get, it was just one of the, the facts of life during the summer, or the early part of the summer, they had the encampment. So they were there early. Yeah, they were oh, early. So, yeah. So, you, so most of the time you were there just for the month of May, you didn't... Well, we, we were there at the end of apricot season, there was a lull between that and picking prunes. Oh. Prunes. That was fun. Yeah. And um, uh, then we would come back to Capitola oh, okay. for okay. two or three weeks. And but we used to take the, we took the, the freeway wasn't in then. We mm -hmm. went through Watsonville and Freedom Boulevard and the long way. The long way. Yeah. And um, but uh, Capitola was really a neat little town then. Uh, Did you ever go to the Hawaiian Gardens? Well, what the original Hawaiian Gardens was right behind the center of, in the mercantile center is. Uh -huh. There used to be a bowling alley in there. There used they, to be two bowling alleys. Two bowling alleys? Yeah, there was a bowling alley. There was a theater in there. Oh, it's the same as a theater. Yeah, I know. There was a theater building. and there was a bowling alley next to it. Uh -huh. And then... <clears throat> that was torn down, and then they had a had the um, Hawaiian Gardens, which had these marvelous. It was right in the center, right, and uh, on on San Jose Avenue. Right? It was between San Jose and Stockton. Was it? Yeah, it was, it was right in the center of town, and uh, when the man used to hire dirt cheap us kids to ride in the back of a big A-frame trailer. And with a megaphone and a phonograph, and advertise the, the Hawaiian Gardens. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we went really? around from Santa Cruz to Santa Cruz and back to Capitola and over to Rio del Mar. So you just went around with a megaphone saying, you know, yeah, dance, we were back there and dance <clears throat> tonight. At and we, they, with our little squeaky voices, danced tonight at, at the <laughs> Hawaiian Gardens. That's Garden. great. What a great story. And, uh, uh, so they, they did. Was this when they did marathon dancing, or because I heard they well, had these? Well, I was pretty young then, and I, I, uh, I would, I got my aunt and uncle got the tickets I got for free oh. to go, and I oh, never oh, did. Oh, oh. I never did. You well. never went. No, but they. I didn't go until they moved it after the fire, and they built the uh, down the, by the where the Sabo was. Yeah, the Sabo yeah, was down yeah. there. Where the ho hotel had been. <laughs> and, the, and the hotel and the wax museum. And the wax museum. Oh, did you go into the wax museum? I, I, went, was gonna, in, I went in there once, but it, it wasn't, didn't. Everything looked kind of dead. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not moving too much. But I just want to go back a little bit and get um, get the names of your your parents and your. Well, my mother was Zalma, and the, her mother's name was Rex, so it was Zalma Rex. And you don't hear that name Zelma anymore. No, no, no. more Zelmas. And the, the last name, how did, is that Rex? R, yeah, Rex. Oh. R E C H T. Oh, okay. And uh, she had a sister and a brother. 
and his sister was a school teacher in Castorville. Oh. <laughs> and <laughs> the brother was a farmer in Hollister. And he stayed in Hollister and she didn't. The sister. And uh, the family name originally was was Sally, as I said before. It was, uh -huh. And it was uh, Abraham Sally and they settled in Hollister on, of all places, Sally Street. <laughs> So you had the family, it was prunes and apricots? They had prunes and apricots, and then they rented out the flat land to uh, strawberry growers and truck farmers. Oh, okay. And Hollister at that time had a ballpark between the main Samanita Street and the railroad tracks. It was, a, it was one of the you know farm leagues, and uh, the... Grandfather owned a great grandfather owned a big lot in front of the house, and they used to um, <laughs> made me very popular as a kid. Rent it out to the circus twice a year. Oh, it wouldn't make you popular. Oh yes, I guess I got a bucket full of passes, and uh, it was uh, it was one of those little traveling circuses they had in the twenties, uh -huh. and uh, so they came to your your your. They, yeah, because it was centered. It was it was it was right across the. It was just one block off of Main Street, uh -huh. San Benito Street, uh -huh. and there was lots of parking around for their horses and buggies and old Model A's, and. Uh, so this was this was in the twenties. It was in the twenties. Yes. Yeah. So by, um, so you came to Capitola every summer from the nineteen twenties until. Well, you my you mother and father stay. lived in Seattle. Oh, okay. And uh, my father was uh, worked in Alaska. He owned a dog team company. A dog team company? Dog team company. They had uh, five teams, I think, of dogs. And they trucked mail and supplies all over the Alaska during the gold rush. My goodness. And his father was a, <clears throat> a minister with Episcopalian Church, uh -huh. and how he got here, I have no idea, because it's, I have a cousin in a, in Scotland who's big on genealogy, and he's still trying to figure out, I think he crossed the border. Oh, he crossed it. <laughs> before it became popular. Uh -huh. From Canada. Uh -huh. And uh, he had a, um, he was a, with Episcopal Church in Santa Cruz, Capitola. Oh, was he? Yeah. He was at St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Capitola. And uh, he lived in a little house <clears throat> right off of Monterey, where the steps go up and there's a step that cuts. Uh, well, he lived in a little house that's no uh, longer there. And what was his name? His name was Thomas George King. Oh, okay. So I could have been running into more than one king. And <laughs> well, you might have run into him, but not into my father. Yeah. Because <clears throat> oh. my father only came down here once or twice to Capitola. Uh. And then I moved to Hollister when I was about five years old. Oh, okay. And I lived with my grandmother, Florence Reck. And she was originally a Sally. And... Um, so you stayed in Hollister until you were... I stayed in Hollister until I got out of high school. So you graduated from Hollister High? No. No? No. I, my senior year, I went to a school up in the Santa Cruz Mountains called Montezuma Mountain School for Boys. Montezuma Mountain School for Boys? I've never <laughs> heard of this place. Well, Montezuma, it was right above Los Gatos. Oh, okay. And uh, it was a school for, and uh, it was a live-in school and uh, I didn't really like it, but uh, but my mother parked me there for the year, uh -huh. and I graduated. And then I didn't quite finish at the end. Then the last part, I went. I decided that I wanted to go the whole senior year, so I went to Galileo High School in San Francisco. Oh, okay. And graduated from there. So then you were in San Francisco. Yeah, I lived in San Francisco then. And then, is that where you got interested in photography? Yeah, I had, oh, I had, right after the war, I opened. A, I became a freelance photographer, 
and I did uh, national magazines. So the Life a, magazine didn't pay very well. They paid a page rate if you were freelancing. Oh, uh huh. And they would buy the picture and whatever they would get for the advertising rate for that picture, they would pay. Oh, that's what you yeah. got. I think for the picture of the, the for the from San Francisco, the Opera Bowl was about a hundred and fifty dollars, two hundred dollars for the picture. And that was in. Oh, that was after way, the war. Yeah, way back in the fifties. Well, that was pretty good. I mean. Yeah, that, that was good then, but. Well, you know, I just, while you were um, while you were a photographer, there was this picture in Fortnite magazine. Which is became it's part of one of my favorite chapters of Capitola history, which is because Capitola is going to be celebrating its 60th birthday this coming year, in, in, uh, uh, after ja in January. There was um, this article in Fortnite magazine that talked about how um, John Battistini wanted to. He, he started the incorporation drive to make Capitola a city because he wanted to bring gambling into Capitola. And so recently you helped me out when I um, was trying to show how important that Battistini was to city history because I opened up the Fortnite magazine and um, I think it's, yeah, here's my copy. See, I actually have this magazine. And, and it says, Photograph, you know, that's your picture. Um, yeah, there's your name up there, Tom. King. Yeah. So, um, I just wondered if what you could tell me about this this uh, article and when you took the picture and how it felt to come back to Capitola. Well, the picture was taken in the in the fifties, early part of the fifties, and uh, most of my friends of in Capitola at that time uh, were. Amateur fishermen, oh, uh -huh. Sunday weekend fishermen off of the pier or off of a boat, and uh, they became friends with Battistini, and therefore I became friends with Battistini. Because his house is right there his by the wharf. His house is right there by the yeah. wharf, and, it's, uh... and they were always amazed how big the house was at that time because not, nobody built big houses. No, but not after the war. No. So we, I have a picture here too. I was going to show you. This is the house under construction. Yeah, that's house under construction. So that's how it looked when you first got a glance at yeah, it. Yeah, that was, and and they people always used to say, well, this room is a the downstairs room is a big room, and and they used to have their living quarters upstairs, and he said it would be ideal for the purpose of small in-house gambling. Uh -huh. But. Uh, uh, it never came about that it was... The city kind of laughed it off. Yeah, too. they like, kind of laughed it, it, it off. But in this article they were saying that he, people didn't want Brad to become the first mayor because he was a friend of... Brad McDonald yeah. was a friend of um, John Battistini. And so they made Kessler the first mayor and there was almost a riot <laughs> in Capitola because Brad had gotten the most votes and they thought Brad should be the first mayor. Bad luck Brad. Yeah. That was he was known. Oh, that. bad luck Brad. Yeah. And why was he bad luck Brad? I mean, Well, I he know. had the, uh, he was in cahoots with somebody, I don't, can't remember who, with uh, um, Rio Del Mar Sands, the oh, country the club. Oh, Rio Del Mar Hotel? Yeah, when yeah. it burned down. Yes, he and was. And then... Uh, and he had the Saba. Uh, then he had the Saba, and it burned down, and that's when he got the nickname Bad, bad Luck, Luck Brad. Brad yes. And um, so then, this was his first little piece of bad luck when he didn't get to be mayor. <laughs> yeah, that was the start of his run of bad luck. <laughs> and then uh, Brad and um, um, P Podesta started Shadowbrook. Oh, that's right. That's and, right. Uh, these that was before. I think before becoming yeah. the city, and the two old friends of mine that were weekend fishermen went up to see. Were invited up by Brad to see the Shadowbrook, and uh, this one of my friends said, "Old Joe said, uh, where are they going to sell the booze?" He's an Irishman, right. and uh, they, the man says, "No, we don't. We're not going to sell booze. We're going to only have wine." He says, "You'll never make it." <laughs> <laughs> he kind of proved him wrong, didn't he? Yes. <laughs> so, you were hired to take this picture? No. 
you, I, this was part of our campaign about article, any articles we could get this in about Capitola. Oh. That's when we were trying to save Capitola. Uh-huh. And <clears throat> then we, the reporter and another man came down. We went up to see Father Phelan, who had, he was the, the priest at the Catholic Church. Uh-huh. Yes, and, I remember uh, that. Pardon? I mean, I remember yeah. he was there. And we knocked at his back door. We knew better never go to his front door because he would never come to that. And he came out and he had a huge cat. Must have been 35 pounds. And his name was Buster. And Father Phelan came out and he said, Buster, get out of the way. And the cat just lay there and looked at us and looked at him. And he opened the door and gave the cat a big kick, and the cat went flying. And he's, "I told you, Buster, get out of the way." <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he was, he was, uh, he was quite a, quite a man. So, he, um, so he was connected to uh, your efforts to save Cap. Well, Capitola. he was part of the story. <clears throat> ah. He liked the town as it was, again, and because the sisters were right across the street. Yes. From the yeah. from the church at, at the Rispin Mansion. It, it, no, they were in that little. You know where oh, the oh, yes, is. Yes, yes, yeah. I know there was a house. There was, an a, little, house. There was a little house yes. there. Yeah, and um, Monsignor Phelan was was quite outspoken, and uh, every sun every summer when summer season began, he always started his sermon by saying, "My name is Father Phelan." I am not related to the San Francisco Rich Phelans, or I would be Bishop of the Archdiocese. <laughs> so anyway, then he went on his little sermons. And, but uh, he was kept everything up to date, and he let the, the visitors know that this was his show uh-huh. and his, his business. And I remember the first year that they had the, the Nivisity scene out in in front of the church in the yard and since some kids stole all the all the Christ child and uh, oh, sold oh, everybody. Sold, sold sold everybody. Everything. Yeah. But they found them somewhere at some place. Nearby, yeah. yes, I'm sure. So this is the church when it was at the corner of um Right Bay. across from Gales. Yes, across from Gales. Yeah. Bay and uh, Capitola Avenue, right. yes. And uh um it was torn down in nineteen seventies. Yeah, I remember Four, was, then when they built the new one. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, now I had I was going to show you a picture because you mentioned that <clears throat> you remembered the porcelain factory, and <clears throat> and <clears throat> and I see that I misplaced it. Talk on it. Yes, the porcelain factory was was uh, in the old um, right in was, in the old opera house. Well, I don't remember the uh, that part really. I remember uh, Mr. Jarvis and the garage, ah. and um, uh, this is the back side of it. I mean, this so is this the front be, of it. Yeah, this. This was right downtown. It was right right on the corner of Main Street and Stockton. No, Stockton no. is Stockton is on the other side. This oh. is the. Oh, okay. This is the other side of the street. Capitola Avenue. Yeah. And this Capitola Avenue isn't here. Yes. And so this would be <clears throat> like San Jose Avenue. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it was a nice little porcelain factory, and people came from all over to get their porcelain. I, I have, I was going to show you. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's the stuff. Huh? That's, a, that's you it. You recognize it. See, it oh, says, you recognize it. California Campo Porcelain. Yeah. Way. So this is the kind of thing that they... They sold lots of it. They, they, they were... People thought that it was quite... Uh, it's quite um, thin. I mean, it's just kind of dainty. It and, is, uh, yeah. I've seen it on sale um, on eBay, and they sometimes advertise it as children's dishware. Yeah, no. But it isn't. It's, no, it's, it's, uh, it's individual. Kind of distinctive. They yeah. had like little Demitasse cups yeah. and... Coffee cups and so did you see a lot of this when they were yeah, making it? They, they made orange, this color, uh, sort of yellow chartreuse uh-huh. and black, and then they made a couple of other colors and they made a white. 
Green. They did a green, I think. I, I, yeah, there was a green, but I, I don't, you know. I'll See, so few people remember this place that it's really interesting to talk to somebody that actually, you know, can remember seeing this because um, it, evidently most people who visited in the summer didn't pay attention to it. No, they were there all year long. They were, they were, they were. They had a crew of maybe 14, 15 artists. I don't know what the size, but they had a crew. They were, they were real craftsmen. Yes, they were artists. And yeah. Vlad Vladimir Mir Dietrich was Dietrich, the head of it. Yeah. Yeah, his name was Dietrich. But this was the old Santa Cruz Opera House that was moved to Capitola in about 1923 or 4, no. just before you came. Yeah. And this was the Opera House part of it. And so then Jarvis was... Um, and Jarvis in his garage in and the, the Capitola Fire, Fire Department. department. Yeah, it was in the front. And uh, so this was one of the first buildings, I think, that was torn down when you, st when you started the Save Old Capitola yes. group. And that was uh, was that redevelopment project to get rid of all those old buildings, or did the city just sort of tell everybody they had to tear these down? What I think they 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 put a little red tag on them and said they had to get rid of them, like they did my house. So they and did that. To, your house was like across the street. My no, right in back of this one. Right back in back of the of, yeah. Right in back of the opera. House. Yes, and they so. put a red tag red tag on it because it had redwood beams first foundation and uh, there were big redwood beams like eight by eights or six by sixes and the man came in to say oh I can tear this down in just a day or two he was there a week later trying to tear it down he said boy this redwood is sure tough <laughs> <laughs> it's a little little harder than he yeah. realized but um, I thought now well, how did you feel when you saw all these buildings being going to be? It was this one whole section, was, which was when we were it? it's over here, right there. That yeah. seemed they lost a lot of buildings, and that's because that was the oldest part of town. That was the first subdivision that Heen did, and so right around here, all of these houses got sort of tagged, and then people started to say they refused to tear their houses down. Yeah, they um, they. Uh there were some of these streets didn't go through they there there was a um, the wall is still there on cherry uh -huh. in stockton yes that's a historic and, uh, feature now but um but this street went up to the top of the hill and uh but and once again i i was i was a teenager then uh -huh. and really didn't give a rap what they were doing uh, so about what year was this? Because this, I remember they took this down about 63, yeah, 1963. So that would have been after you were working as a photographer, right? Yes, I, I was uh, living in San Francisco coming down here on weekends. Ah, and, uh, so you got involved even though you weren't... You weren't uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't permanent. A permanent resident. Yeah. And Bernie Rainwright and I became friends and she was a staunch supporter of Save Old Capitola. And she was. She owned the plum she tree. She owned the plum tree across the street, which was a gift shop. Gift shop. Yeah, yeah. In the that was in the early, early sixties, I think. And then she got on a planning commission. She was on the planning commission, and then, um, then we lost touch after a while after she sold out, uh -huh. and then she moved up to the valley somewhere. Right. Right. She started into, teaching uh, art. 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 Yeah. yeah. It, but you did, were you on the planning commission? No. No, because no. you didn't live in town. No, I didn't live in town. But uh, the planning commission, I remember, <laughs> called a meeting. Um, I can't e remember exactly where it was in Capitola. They planned a meeting, and the week weekend before we get out, we had all the kids in the neighborhood had, handing out these handbills about mm -hmm. the meeting. It was, I think, the meeting was held in the uh, Episcopal Church rec room. On oh, okay, a, up on and, Depot Hill. Yeah, and. It got the crowd got so big they moved over to the Capitola Elementary School Auditorium. Oh, and so you really got a lot of people. Yeah, we had a lot of people there, and um, that was it. in the '60s. There was not only you and Bernie, but there was um, Olaf Palm or Al Palm, the artist. Did yeah. I get a picture of Al here yeah. somewhere? Did you know him? That's how we looked then. He's, yeah. 
help. Oh, man, then there, there was, there were, um, we talked about it the other day, two school teachers. Oh. Um, oh, Wayne Fonts. Font, Wayne Fonts, yeah. And Jim Redding. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, and they did get on the planning commission. Yes, and that yeah. was in the mid-60s. Right. And one of the things that Al did was he said to people, if they, if they would fix their own, he would fix their buildings, their old buildings, if they would pay for the materials. <laughs> and so this one was bu A.V. Bucks. A.V. Bucks real estate real downstairs. Estate. Uh -huh. And he had apartments for rent upstairs. And a good friend of mine who worked for the telephone company lived in one of the apartments upstairs. Oh, really? He was a lineman. Uh -huh. And uh, then A.V. Bucks, um, uh, I don't know what happened to A.V. Bucks, he, whether he was run out of town or he moved out of town. But anyway, then it became a, a, a novelty store. Oh, okay. And then... Uh, Jack McDonald were, or sold real estate in there, too, yeah. but later on. But I, I, it, but I remember the building. It was, it was a, but they had an apartment, and the door was on Stockton Street. Entrance. And then they fix it all. It still looks like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this, I think this was Harry Hooper's um, real estate office, too. Yeah, yeah Harry did Hooper. You, did you know Harry? Yeah, I knew Harry. I knew Harry when he, I knew his son. Harry, much, Harry Hooper Jr.? Jr., who was a real estate man. Uh -huh. And I knew Harry Hooper, the ball player and the postmaster. And he... Uh, and the Capitola at that time probably had the only outside, street-side post office. And all the boxes were on face, the little boxes were on the face. And if you wanted something, you knocked on the door and they'd open the little window and the clerk would take care of you. And when you were through, down goes the window and oh, you go back. Oh, oh. So mail. it was sort of, so it was, it was a, a quiet post office. Yeah. And, and next, right on the corner was a little newsstand. That's where we picked up our papers that we sold. I think I can't remember. I think the papers were twenty-five cents for Sunday edition, uh -huh. for the Examiner, Chronicle, and Mercury Herald, and uh, and the man that, that that he was right now on the little little cigar store right on the corner there, which is I don't know what's there now. There used to be a drugstore. Uh, uh, Rogers. 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 Sherwood. Rogers. Sherwood. Yeah, and Doc Doc Rogers had the drugstore, and he was a fixture in town. Oh, he was? I, yeah. See, I knew his son, I think. Yeah, well, Doc Rogers was a fixture, and he lived up where, um, off of Park Avenue, where that little complex. Yes, of, uh, the, the Antigua. Antigua, yeah. yeah he Antigua. lived there. He had a house there. and um, That's that's um, just right past El Salto yeah, Resort. Yeah. yeah. And then Mrs. Binder. Have you ever heard of her? Mrs. Binder, no, I haven't. Well, Mrs. Mrs. Binder... And her husband built a beautiful little stone cottage down right next to Al Antigua. And they had a chain across the road on the end of El Salto. I've never heard before I mean, who built that stone cottage. Yeah, well, Mrs. Mrs. Binder, Binder and her husband. Okay. And he Do you know went, about what year that was they built that? Because it's... I, I really don't know. They, they built it in the, in the 30s. Okay. But... That makes... That's, that's consistent. But... Uh, they had a chain across uh, Escalona, uh -huh. so you couldn't go drive down there. And El Salto was going because people from Scotland used to come every year to El Salto. Oh. And they rented a big house. There was a big house at the back of El Salto that was all practically all windows on the side. Yes. And Is that was, the one that f fell in or? No, this was this it was burned. this yeah burned. It burned. <laughs> anything is yeah, it <laughs> yes, burns. anything nice it burns. Yeah. Um, but El Salto, and um, they um, and I don't really know what what happened, but the El Salto started selling off the property, and right. people started building big houses there. And, um, and that little stone cottage. Um, the little stone cottage is there. And Mrs. Binder, and, and he was a doctor, I think, and he, he planted down Escalona flowering Japanese cherry trees. Oh. And it was really quite beautiful in the springtime. All the cherry trees were in bloom. And then along came incorporation of Capitola, and uh, 
I can't remember the man's name who said, well, we can't afford to have a gardener take care of these trees, so out they go. <gasps> so they cut all the trees down. It wasn't Do Joe Tabacchini, Dab Tabacchini? No. He, he owned El Salto. No, and it wasn't, no, no, it, it wasn't, wasn't him. him, no. This was, a, this was, was a real estate man, and um, oh. he lived on Escalona, down near the end of Escalona. And, oh, uh, he was probably the city manager. Yeah, well, he didn't like the, he he didn't the, like the uh, little cherry trees, but they were quite beautiful. Oh, so they all got chopped down? They all got chopped down. Anything beautiful, really. It is and uh, Mrs. I saw Mrs. Binder a few years later, and she says, I can't remember her husband's first name. She said, well, he'd sure be spinning in his grave now. <laughs> <laughs> if he could see that. Yeah. So when did you, now how did you get from being a photographer in San Francisco to uh, having, here's a picture of you, and I have a photo, at the Courtyard Restaurant, which is the old carriage house of the Avaron, next to the Capitol Mansion Apartments on Capitol yeah, Avenue. This, yeah, the, uh, Mrs. Goodrich and her husband own the property. And that Violet was, Goodrich. Oh, oh, Vi Good, Goodrich. Yeah. Okay. And... Uh, Back in, <clears throat> I got into food photography way back, and I used to do lots of food photography for a wonderful woman by the name of Clementine Paddleford. She was long before Julia Child. Ah. And uh, she had a, um, I sound like I have one, a larynx box. Uh -huh. And she couldn't eat any of the food that she was writing about. she just oh. taste it, uh -huh. but she couldn't swallow it, kind of her larynx box. So I used to taste, be a, taste the food for her and tell her it was good or bad. Oh, <laughs> and, so you so you learned to tell what was really good food? Well, we I went mean. around and do, to, did stories on chefs and so uh -huh. forth, and I kept an eagle eye open. And in 1967, um, Wally Raymond, who used to be work for Levi Strauss, and I decided that we would open a restaurant. But where? Capitola. That's a good place. So we came down and we found Violet's place and she said she would rent it to us. And so we started working on it and in June 1968 we opened. But Wally never made it because just at that time his wife was in a terrible automobile accident and was severely burned. Oh. So he flew, threw up his hands and I had all of this money invested in it and so we said well, okay I'll run it and we'll see about it later so that's how I got stuck in it and I started I so did, did you you actually began cooking as oh yeah I did all the cooking for it and uh, it became known as you know like one of the nice places to eat in the area especially there wasn't very many no there weren't there weren't very many places we we only served lunches at the beginning of the, in the, at the restaurant and somebody said, why don't you serve dinners? I said, no, I don't want to work all day and all night, too, because I used to get at the restaurant about 6.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, and then I left, closed it up about 5. So we decided to have dinners on Saturday night only, because we had Sunday brunch. That was a big biggie in those days. And... To get people to come to the restaurant on Saturday night to initiate it, we did silent movies. No. We had a movie projector and we, we had, I've bought a whole mess of 16 millimeter silent films and, uh -huh. and we had silent movies. And people just flocked to see them because they sold Charlie Chaplin. Oh, and, yeah, besides that would be something to do, yeah. you know. And uh, so, um, so... This was in the late 60s then when you, yeah, when you that, had the Yeah, this was 68, 69. Yeah. And, uh, so did you get a lot of hippies coming in? And well, we, and... had, we had a few. We had a few that came through. and But they didn't last long because... We were kind of straight, and we didn't kind of food that they kind of liked. Our food was more continental food than wasn't nuts and berries. What and... Mom used to cook in the. We didn't. Have, we never had meatloaf. 
<laughs> and uh, we uh, we did have uh, we made uh, a different form of uh, we made it had a on Wednesdays we usually had a, a Mexican dish oh on the menu and there was a friend of mine who was from Mexico and we made an enchilada like his mother made was an open tortilla and we had everything on it. It was this is before Taco Bell made the roll up burrito. Mm -hmm. We put the in the tortilla. Only could use corn. We couldn't use flour tortillas. We only use corn. Mm -hmm. That's traditional. And uh, so we made it had enchilada and but we put all a lot of different things in it then then we put olives and fruit and different things in it that normal people didn't do traditional enchiladas. So that's when you got the Cabrillo faculty coming over for... Well, they, they came. Matter of fact, I was going through some old pictures and I found a group of the faculty having, having their picture taken in the, in the courtyard of the, the old, old restaurant. Well, this picture that I have of you in the courtyard, I think this is Begonia Festival. Did you, uh, did you do anything with the Cabrillo Begonia, or the Capitola Begonia? We, we did. We had, <coughs> we had a number of political um, rallies, I mean, parties there, meet the, meet the candidate. candidate. Mm -hmm. And we had, uh, um, I was still had a lot of friends on the old San Francisco Examiner, and they had uh, several of the San, Miss Santa Cruz, uh -huh. California, uh -huh. Uh, luncheons there, and they used to come and take pictures of them at the courtyard. And well, it uh, was a nice setting. Oh, now speaking of the setting, you called me one day and told me a funny story <coughs> about the Avaron house and the, the lodge. Two, the lodge ladies. Yeah, the lodge sisters. The lodge sisters were 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 really neat ladies. This yeah. was a. Uh, so it was Carrie and Lulu. Lulu, it, yeah, Lulu was, and they were the granddaughters of Martina Castro. Yeah, I think who's yeah. the grantee of the SoCal Rancho. Well, and, uh, Lulu was was, was, the, was was she was really outgoing, and and she used to bring me tomatoes every once in a while, and blackberries. Come pick your own blackberries, and uh, I used to talk to her. My driveway went right down the side of the house, and. So before they built the before they the built mansion. oh a long time before that yeah the mansion apartment there I think I left you a picture of it I, yes you did the best picture I've ever seen as a matter of fact and um, I used to go over and talk to her and one day I saw her hand waving up and down in the bushes and I heard her little voice and I went over and I said what'd you do and she said I fell down in a hole. And I said, well, let me help you. No, don't try it. You'll hurt yourself. Just call 3A. They know what to do. I called 3A, and <clears throat> the guy knew what to do, and he brought a strap and put it underneath her and hoisted it up, hoisted, off, hoisted it up off the field, and she dusted herself off and went back to work. <laughs> Every once in a while, we'd have a, a, a somebody come in and work for us for the summer, and uh, we had one girl who came in and worked for us for the summer, and uh, and I asked her, I brought these crates of strawberries, and I said, I want to fix these strawberries for Sunday brunch. And will you just stem them for me? Oh, sure. You know how to do it? Oh, sure. And I happened to look out the window, and she was taking the strawberries and cutting them in half and throwing the top part away and oh, just dear. keeping the bottom. And I went out there, and I said, no, no, that's not how you stem them. She says, well, that's how my mother stems them. I said, well, your mom's wrong. I hate to tell you that. <laughs> So anyway, I gave her a spoon, and she started stemming him right. But there were people who that we got working for us that uh, that tried to talk us into vegetarian stuff. There were the vegetarian movement was just starting, and uh, he had a friend. Um, he wasn't a true vegetarian, but he was getting leaning that way. He had a friend that raised chickens up up the valley above Bargetto's that were range-free chickens. They were, and uh, I'd call him up and tell him I'm going to come up and get four or five chickens, and he'd go out there and with, they had a big net on a stick, and he'd 
whack, catch him alive, and he'd do all the rest for you. He'd huh? clean them and pluck them and everything. And uh, then the vegetarian thing got a little bit out of hand for for a little tiny restaurant. You couldn't have all vegetable. You could have. We did have <clears throat> an all salad dish with all vegetable salad dish and things like that. What was the culinary? What was the culinary scene in Santa Cruz in the sixties? It was kind of homespun. What Mama cooked, that's what they had in the restaurants. That's what I remember. And um, I did a lot of traveling when I was a freelance photographer. I went all around the world, and I picked up recipes from different places. And so I said, well, heck with it. We'll experiment. We'll try these things. Ah. And uh, I, one of the things I started making was cannelloni. And... Uh, Nobody had it on their menus because I went right. around to different restaurants to see what their menus had, and I tried to have everything that they didn't, didn't have. Didn't have, so you offered something new. Yeah, we had that, and we we had fresh ground coffee. We bought coffee from Graffio Coffee Company in San Francisco, and the beans, and we ground it, and we used uh, a system that people, some people are familiar with today, Melita coffee. Oh yes. Every once in a while at luncheon, we'd have a group of people and somebody would say, oh, I can't drink coffee at lunch and they can't, can't sleep at night. And I said, well, here's my phone number. If you can't sleep at night, give me a call and I'll talk to you. <laughs> and I never got a you phone never call. Got a phone I never call. got a phone call. So, <laughs> And we served lunch every day except Monday. And we, we were closed Monday. We uh -huh. had Sunday brunch, which was very popular champagne brunch and then uh, we moved to Main Street in 1970, 71 oh, okay. and what happened to be it was a terrible rainy day and there were two gentlemen having lunch and one of them said did you ever, did you ever think of moving to a place of your own? And I said, well, I would, but I don't know any place to move to. He says, well, we own a piece of property down on Main Street in SoCal. We'll build for you whatever you want. So, and that's how that building got there. And that's how the building got there. And uh, it was... Uh, did, did Main Street, SoCal, go through? Yeah, the Main South Street Main? Yeah, went all the way through. It, it went through. It didn't used to. I mean, it didn't originally. No, it, it it went, it, it, there was a Texaco station at the corner uh -huh. and right across from... Carpos is now. I think there's still a gas station there. I don't know. Yeah, if there is a station. Yeah. yeah, but and then, then Main Street. I mean, uh, the other little restaurants and gift shops came in a little bit later. Anyway. So this was. I mean, just thinking in terms of Cabrillo College at that time. Cabrillo was completed in 1962 out in Aptos, and so as I recall, because I worked for the newspaper in Watsonville, yeah. that. The, the whole emergence of the Cabrillo Music Festival, and there was a whole <coughs> cultural change going it's on whole, at that time. It, it changed. And so your restaurant sort of fit in with that. It became a place where people who, you know, appreciated art and culture, you know, we were very attracted to. We got a lot of the faculty from Cabrillo at that time. And uh, uh, the, in fact, one of the members of the faculty at that time um, was a lady by the name of uh, Claire Biancolani. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. Claire used to come to the restaurant with her faculty members. And uh, one of them asked me if I would be willing to take on teaching children. Oh. And I hesitated and I said, here? And she said, yes. So I taught there for two so-called school semesters. <clears throat> was this in the high school? No, little kids. Oh, little kids. Little kids, oh. yeah, little kids. And um, <laughs> the, uh, then they moved it to uh, <clears throat> the economic home ec room over at Cabrillo. Oh, okay. They moved the class And that's where Claire was the teacher. <clears throat> that Claire yes. was the uh, home ec teacher, I think. Yes, I hadn't, happened to leave the room one day. We were cooking chicken. 
and I happened to leave the room one day and I came back and there were two little boys running around with naked chickens with their wings out going brrrr <laughs> like aeroplanes. So I didn't leave the room very often. <laughs> <laughs> Kids said, "Did any of the, do you know if any of the, your your young students ever became chefs?" Uh, quite a few of them are, are still <clears throat> were around. Um, they uh, Stephanie Schaefer, I think her, her name was Stephanie Schaefer. She opened a bakery over uh, near next door to uh, uh, Orchard Supply uh -huh. and Gail Ortiz, who's Gail's bakery, uh -huh. was Gail. one of my students as, at, at Cabrillo. Oh, and she must have been. Well, this was a little bit a few years later. A few I'm years just, later. Okay, just, no, I'm thinking, but she was. She would have been in her twenties. Yeah, she yeah. she she wanted to be baking, and uh, Floyd Younger was my head boss uh -huh. at that time. Floyd was the vice president at yeah. Cabrillo? Yeah. And I had to call him one day and I said, I have this young lady who wants to be in my class, but she is only interested in baking. What will I do? And he said, let her bake. <laughs> <laughs> let her bake. Well, it was a good advice, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was very good advice. Yeah. Gail was trying to make the first croissant, I remember. There was, yeah, there was she, nobody she, around could make croissants no, in no, those days. No, no, she was, she was a really a, an ambitious young lady. She still ambitious. She still is, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So was she, and she was a good student when you were? Yes, yeah. yeah. So how many years did you do, do the teaching at Carrillo? <laughs> It was quite a few, wasn't it? Sixteen years. Sixteen years. Sixteen years. See, we have when we do have a picture of you um, making soup f uh, for the Cabrillo Music Festival. Oh yeah, that was that, that was that was the festival. Then we got then we got uh, did had a lot of students participating in the uh, the, the fish day clam cook off and chowder cook off on uh -huh. the pier. Oh, so that's what this was? This is the chowder cook-off? I think that might have been the ch chowder cook-off the first year ah. we did it. Did you ever go to Shadowbrook in those days? Or, uh, I know. Because no. you were in San Francisco. Yeah, I, I didn't go. I, I went after the war um, in the 50s, when it, after it had been going for about a couple of years. Then you, then you go yeah. down in, in the... They had the tram, or did you? Yeah, get, they, did that tram was. That, that's why we went because we oh. wanted to go down the tram. Oh, yeah, that was quite an attraction. So you got to go back and see this place that you remember playing as a kid. Right. right. Yeah. So you can see how much had changed. Yeah. And, she had the the house has the main building, where the tram enters, hasn't changed that much. Oh. I mean, I mean uh -huh. from the way it oh it's changed a great deal, but I mean, the stairs going down. That was their living room down there, and the dining room was out where the dining room is now. There was a big window area there and oh. a porch, uh -huh. and the and that. So it's so it keeps some of its character. Yeah, and that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize that. So we were talking about culinary history of Capitol and Mid County, and right. um, and you were out at uh, Cabrillo. Well, how we, how we get started at Cabrillo is I taught a year and a half for Don um, Edler, Edler at the Board of Education uh, at, the, uh, uh, at Harbor High School. Mm -hmm. I taught, I had a cooking class, and it was for students that uh, didn't quite make the grade on what they wanted to do. It was an occupational program mm -hmm. and uh, it was the kids really didn't know anything. They couldn't even count. These are juniors, seniors, juniors, freshmen in high school. They trucked them in from all over the county. Uh -huh. So after about three weeks of, of teaching, maybe the th second month, I went over to see Edler and I said, would it be all right if one day a week we could just play dominoes in class? And he said, dominoes? I said, yes, it'll teach them to count. 
one, two, three, four, five, you know? <laughs> and he said, oh, okay. So at first they didn't quite take on dominoes. And so I said, okay, the winner today for this domino class, and we had it every Friday, uh-huh. wins $2.00. So I put up two dollars, and oh, they all got, they got very much interested in, and pretty soon they learned to count. When I said that something takes a cup and a half of flour, they could, they, they could, know what that is, or uh, five yeah, eggs yeah. or something. Uh-huh. <laughs> five eggs. That was a funny story. I had a student in the class that didn't know a bean about anything. And we were baking a cake, and it says six whole eggs. Oh dear. Yes, oh dear. <sighs> he took the whole eggs and just threw them in six, one egg, bum, 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 shell and all, uh-huh. put them in the mixer and mixed them all up, and didn't tell anybody how he made it. And the cake was really crunchy. I bet it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, but. Uh, did anybody eat it? I mean, oh well, they did. They ate around it. <laughs> they, they ate around it. But laughing, I bet. The laughing, they yeah. think. And uh, so, how did you you got out to Cabrillo uh, after? Well, after that, uh, I heard of a job opening, and at the uh, school, the junior college, the College of the Delaware in Pennsylvania. So I said, "What the heck? I'll try that." So I went back, applied for it, I got the job, offered the job, but my first class started at 8 o'clock in the morning and went till 10. Then there was a break and the next class started at 6 o'clock at night and oh, ended man. at 9. <clears throat> so you had a long day. If I had taken the job, because ah. I lived 50 miles from oh, so Trenton. you would have, you would have had to stay there all day. I'd have had to stay there all day, and I talked to the dean of the program, and I said that what what can I do? He says, "Well, we only have the cooking class, culinary program." That uh, I said, so I called up. I went back to my place where I was staying in Pennsylvania. And I called up Mike Beeler at Cabrillo College. Oh, I remember he, Mike Beeler. You remember Mike mm-hmm. Beeler? And Mike Beeler <clears throat> had something to do at that time with personnel. Yes. And I called him up and I said, Mike, help. Are there any openings at Cabrillo? He says, yes, we have an opening. When? And then he told me. So I made a booked flight. I flew out to San Francisco rented a car, went, came down here, stayed at the Holiday Inn, had an appointment with the school, and of all things, going to the school, what did I do? I got a flat tire. And so I had to get on the, we didn't have cell phones then. No. So I had to walk along there, and I finally got off and called Cabrillo and told him, and he said, don't worry, there, somebody else is late. So I got there. And uh, I was offered the job. I went back to Pennsylvania, picked up my things, and said bye bye. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm out of here, and went to Cap- and to Cabrillo. So, and at that time, the program had seven or eight students, uh-huh. and a man by the name of Gundren was running the program, and uh, he wasn't very progressive Uh and uh, the students weren't really getting turned on about anything and so we got going and by the second semester we had 25 students wow and uh, we we ran the cafeteria the students yeah we ran we ran the cafeteria and uh, and uh after this maybe second year, the third year, I said the student thought the students have to get a little bit more hands on because they all can't be cooking. Uh-huh. They want to do something in food. 
So I set up a deli at one end of the counter. I heard of a man who wanted to get rid of a deli case. So I had it brought in and set up. And the kids ran a deli, delicatessen. They yeah. cut the meat, they made the sandwiches, they did everything. Wow. And uh, that was quite popular. And, uh, and the other students that didn't work in the deli, they cooked the meals and served on the line. And what, one of the jobs they didn't like to do was do dishes, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. This was in like the mid-1970s? Was this? Yeah, this was... Because I think <clears throat> I remember. 70s. Yeah. And we got really got rolling in the 80s. Now, when you started to do... You started to do the dinners? Yeah, we had the little room we called... There again, we, we decided to, uh, a lab technician and I got together one day and we decided that the students aren't getting a really a rounded feel for culinary. So we said, we have to start a dining room. Well, where? Well, there was a room that we called, it was a teacher's lounge. Yes, I remember that. And so we decided, well, we'll just sneak it in. So we, one Sunday or one weekend, we went in and we put in booths, petitions and booths. And when the teachers came in the next Monday to have their coffee and stuff for lunch, they looked around and they saw all this. And they what is this? Well, at nighttime, we have this as a dining room. We call it the back dining room. And uh, the students cooked and served. And it became quite popular. It was. I, I think <clears throat> I was, I remember eating there about 1978. Yeah, it was the best kept secret around. It was, it was called the back room or the, yeah, yeah, the back, back dining room. room. Yeah. And uh, then... Um, there was only like four or five little... Um, we had <laughs> yeah, four or five little booths and then uh -huh. we had a couple of big tables in the middle. And somebody said, well, can't you serve wine or something? I said, no, you can't serve wine on a school. Oh, I said, but I'll look into it. So I went over to see Bob Swenson. Uh -huh. He was president at that time. And I said, Bob, have you ever gone out to have dinner and not have wine with your meal? He said, I can't remember. I said, he said, why? I said, well, we want to have, figure out some way we can serve wine with at the back dining room so the students can get a rounded feeling of because they did everything everything yeah so he went to the board <laughs> and uh, i think frantish uh, i can't remember her first name oh yes um, i can't either well anyway she was on the board and he stood up and he said i want to make a proposal i want to ask you a question and he asked him the same question that you asked ask him <laughs> about having wine with dinner. And they all said, yes, they had wine with dinner. And except one gentleman, I can't remember his name. But anyway, um, they voted on it and they said, yes, we can use wine. We have a wine. We had a wine class. We had a man by the name of um, Louis Bergna. He worked for Paul Masson in... Oh, Los Gatis, uh -huh. uh -huh. <clears throat> and he was our first wine teacher, and so, uh, we had a wine appreciation class, <clears throat> and uh, so we. I well, my job was to go around to the wineries and scrounge wine because we couldn't buy the wine. Uh huh. And then I talked to another teacher at a school over in Los Gatis at West Valley, and he said, well, why don't you start a club, a catering club? And the profit you make from the catering club, put that into a wine project, and you could buy the wine. Uh -huh. And it, the school has nothing to do with it. So we did that. We started a catering club. And uh, Now, what is what happens in a catering club? Well, a catering know? club, say you're going to, know somebody's going to get married uh -huh. and they want to have a, a a party. Well, we would furnish all the food and the service and then they would pay for the food and they'd pay for the service and the kids would take no money 
this credit for doing it, and the money would go into the, a, oh, the a fund. fund. And Billy Paul at that time. Um, Billy Paul, I remember her. She was the student in the student's affairs yes. office. She ran our book banking account. So any any she, money we would get, we'd give it to her, and they would would then we could buy the wine, and we got the wine at a a, a good price. It wasn't store price, but it was good price, and. Uh, and then we sold the wine with included in the dinner, wine with the dinner and wine without a dinner. And that's how the how it got started. Now that's why they have the back the Palo Alto, Palo Alto room or in the yes, old yeah, Cessna in the house. Cessna house. And it's much larger now. It's uh, Oh yeah. yeah. To... Well we tried to get the Cessna house for for many years for uh, our culinary program. Mm. But we couldn't get it because it didn't meet the Brown Act. Oh. And uh, it wasn't earthquake proof. Oh. Then came along the earthquake in 1989 yeah. and that, that changed started everything. Get yes, yes. a new culinary program. Yes, that allowed them to. That, that was one of the odd benefits of the earthquake. Uh, and scrounging the wines, we uh, went to Bargetto, we went to uh, uh, Devlin. We went to um, the doctor, I can't think of his name, up in the hills above Los Gatos. David Bruce. David Bruce's, and, uh, and we told them about our problem and while we were trying to, and we told them the benefits of it <laughs> for them, that we would, we would push their wines and, and, uh, and uh, someday these students would be wine Merchants and concierges and so forth and no, that's the wrong word. But anyway, they'd be selling wines and and so they all they all supported this. Um, Larry Bargetto was very good, and uh, Devlin was very good, and they were the best. Uh, we did get some wine from through Paul Bergna. I mean, um, Louis Bergna in, um, from Los Gatos. And, but most, uh, of you, most of the wine came but from most local. But all of the wine was local, all local wine. Uh, there was a, I uh, can't remember the name of it now, there was a winery up off of Soquel Drive, up in the, uh, there was a little winery up there, he gave us some wine, but I can't remember his name. Is that the judge? The, um, judge Marlowe? Marlowe. Was it in Aptos? It was in Aptos. I can't remember the name. He volunteered the wine, actually. Uh -huh. and, there is a little vineyard up there. Yeah. And uh, Ted Whiting from the Seaside Company, he, he helped us, too. Oh. Uh, and uh, he saw that we got glasses and he got a lot of things that, we couldn't buy through the school normally. Uh -huh. We could buy food and things like that that there was the students used, and but things that fringe things we had to scrounge and figure out some way. The, the to, things that to, you would actually to need. Get them, yeah. Yes. So, um. well, for the back dining room, you ask about our menus. Well, the students we had a menu planning class. And the students planned the menu. Uh, the students purchased the, ordered the goods, and uh, then they cooked the good. They cooked the cooked the products that we had on the menu, and uh, they were completely separate from the cafeteria. We kept everything separate. We had the we had a bakery that we was separate, and. Uh, they they would bake special things for the back dining room. Uh, we had um, they had a complete salad section, and uh, during our beginning years, we would we went around to uh, distributors and uh, equipment distributors and try to con <laughs> since the word equipment from them and. One company was very nice. I can't remember their name of it. I should. Uh, they gave us a 
slow cook oven. Wow. And it was a huge thing. It was big as a refrigerator, and it was on wheels. And we would, Denver Meat at that time was our supplier, and uh, we would get our roasts and put our things in the night before, and the next day they would be done. They would cook at, at 120, 190 degrees, just above, above 140, above the line and um, but we, and we we got all of our bread we 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 baked almost all of our rolls uh, occasionally we would have to get bread from oro wheat and uh, they gave, they gave us a break on the on the bread when we when we ordered it but um, it was completely a student operation. We didn't have any, any. So how, how many students were involved by the? Well, the first we had. Uh, oh, one of the first. Our first students. Do you remember the the um, the restaurant down by the post office? Call I think it was called the Fishwife or the Fish. The fisherman's wife. The fish. Fish, fish wife, fish. something like yes. that. Yes. Ted Durkee. Oh, really? Ted and Pat Durkee were students in my class. Really? Yes. So then they came back and did Seafood Mamas. And, oh, Seafood Mamas, that's what it was. Seafood yeah. Mamas. Yeah. And uh, that was after the, after they got out of school. Oh, okay. And they went to school so they could... Because he was the county uh, CA, CEO. He was the... Yeah, he, he was, was the county's... Yeah, yeah. Um, but he wanted to... He administrative wa He officer, wanted to so. get, get the ball rolling. He wanted to learn all about the restaurant business. Yeah, he retired from the county, and then a few years later they opened a seafood. Yeah, and his, his daughter was in the class, and uh, his wife was in the class, and they, they, did, a nice, they did a nice job, and they, they were very proud of the, the back dining room. And, uh, That's amazing. I didn't know that because their restaurant was, you know, was here very close to where your old restaurant was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, was they were upstairs. And we had an instructor who was, um, at that time, uh, with United Airlines in their culinary program. I oh. mean, he was the head of the United Airlines program. And um, he came to me and he says, Durkee's restaurant will never make it upstairs. Who's going to walk upstairs to a restaurant? And I took him down there one time, and the people were just Attacked. streaming like ants <laughs> going up there. And yeah, they uh, didn't. so he said, well, he thought, Some, that, thought that over again. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it works. And they had an elevator up there, too. Yeah, yeah. yes, they had an elevator. But that was an enormously popular restaurant. For it was a very years. popular restaurant. And um, so then, then the uh, restaurant that was down below the Japanese restaurant, uh -huh. Um, we, the lady that helped us, she was actually, she supervised, um, the little Japanese lady, um, Mamiko, I think her name was. Anyway, she and her family started, a that restaurant. Oh. And, uh, she took some of the students to work for her. So a lot of, so local restaurants would yeah. then hire some they, of the students yeah. when they... And the, and, uh... Several of them went to Bittersweet in Aptos, the big restaurant above. Right, uh, Deer Park Tavern. B Deer Park Tavern, yeah. And uh, some of them, uh, well, worked in Maine on uh, downtown Santa Cruz. And do you remember the old Bayview Hotel? Mm hmm. The Tonys ran there. Oh, yeah, Fred, Fred Tony. Fred Tony, yes. And, they had a wonderful restaurant there, and just before they got changed hands and everything, we had a couple of students working there. So, so local restaurants were pretty eager to get your students after a while. They were, yes, and and um, Barry Hutchins, the Broken Egg down in oh, uh huh, yeah, the one in uh, Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, he he was a big supporter of our program. And then when he opened up the Broken Egg in by Safeway mm -hmm. down in 
Aptos, um, he took three students to start it out oh. and full time. And Bill Pickett and well, Bill Pickett, I remember for sure, but the other two fellows, I know them, but I can't remember them. After a while, you get sort of senile. <laughs> names. And do you remember students by what they cooked? <laughs> well, no. I, when I started teaching, a teacher that had been teaching in Cabrillo for many years since it started said, the first thing you have to do when you become a teacher is learn the student's first name. Hmm. And I finally got down to it. I got, I got it down pretty pat so that I could remember, remember the names. names. So you didn't remember them by the grade they got? or No, I never <laughs> remembered them by the grades they got because the grades didn't really mean that much. Uh, how they performed mm. and how they acted and, and, uh, and in the kitchen, that would meant more to me than... So could you spot real talent? I mean, oh, so a student yeah, will come you, along yeah, and you just you go, oh, that one's going to... Yeah. I had this... We had a program at Cabrillo where they took um, students that uh, were handicapped or, or not handicapped, but um, some of them were out of prison. <laughs> oh, uh-huh. And, uh -huh. and they retrained them. And there is this one fellow that he said it takes five pounds of flour and he got this big Hobart mixer. He put the flour and he put the sugar and he put the sugar and flour and salt and all the flavorings and the nuts in it. And he says, now is that it? And he says, well, you have to put the eggs and the liquid in. He says, but mix, mix that up thoroughly before you do that and then add the liquid. So he said, okay. And at that time I wore contact lenses. He flipped the switch to full speed, and flour went everywhere. Oh. He said, that wasn't quite the way to do it. And I said, no, no, turn it off, turn it off. I couldn't see him. I couldn't see anything. I had flour in my eyes. So anyway, he... That was a... That, that, was, was, his, that was a learning lesson. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it was a very good learning lesson. And the other students all got the learning lesson, Oh, too. yes, yes, they saw that doesn't work. <laughs> well, we have to thank... Floyd Younger and Bob Swenson, <clears throat> they were really staunch supporters of the program. Well, you have so many stories. I just want to I thank you so much for coming and spending your whole morning with us. And, and uh, this will be Capitola's 60th birthday coming up. And I, and I know that your story is going to help revive a lot of memories. And, and uh, it really will enrich the the uh, city's whole celebration and appreciation of well, all these years. Thank you. I'm so glad you came and, and helped I explain hope you have my a big, big birthday party. They're going to have a big birthday party. You can go to Gales and have them make a cake. <laughs> we will. I'm sure we will. <laughs>